sharing God's word with you and enjoying fellowship with you this morning. It's always a joy and a privilege to come and uh, have fellowship with brothers and sisters. For those who are hope is in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Do we just spread the word from the Lord in prayer? Father God, we bless you and thank you that through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can approach thy throne of grace. And Father, we do pray that you would help us this morning in our weaknesses, that your Spirit would breathe upon the Word, and that you would open up our understanding, and that, Lord, you would help us not just to be hearers of your Word, but help us to be doers. Lord, we confess without you we can do nothing, and we are praying that you would guide us now, and that you would bless us. And we do pray even for this fellowship, O oh God, we are looking for a pastor, a shepherd, to lead a flock, but, Lord, you will guide them to the right man. It would be the man of you were choosing, and we know then, Lord, you were blessing be upon it. So, Lord, guide us now as we come around your word. Speak into our hearts and help us, Lord, to love you more and to serve you. That even in these closing days, our lives will bring glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank you again for the invitation. My text is found in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 3. I'll only read a few verses uh, just to give us a bit of grounding. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word. You know, Paul writing to these, the church at Philippi says, For our conversation is in heaven. Yeah. Notice Paul, in these couple of verses we read, he's making a contrast with those who are worldly, those uh, whose roots go down deep into the earth, like the ten pegs, they drive them into the earth. Uh, some people say, you know, they're like the cedars of Lebanon, and they say that as high as the tree goes up, his roots go down deep. And these people are worldly. Everything is about this life. And Paul is making a contrast between those who are worldly and those who are heavenly. And although as we, the children of God, uh, we also live here on the earth, you know, we live, we eat, we drink, we breathe, you know, the same air as others, as those who know not God and have not tasted the things of God. And yet, dear friends, the apostle reminds us that this world is not our home. This world is not our home. Yeah? Yes, we dwell in houses, we work just as others, we pay our taxes, we drive our cars, our children go to the same school as others, and we try our best to keep the laws of this land as long as these laws are not in contradiction with God's laws. Amen? That's our uh, priority. We obey God's word. And yet, the Bible says, we are but children. Pilgrims, sojourners, as the good old King James puts it, we are only passing through. Do you know that? We are only passing through. The hymn this says, listen, heaven is better than this. Praise God. We are going to somewhere better, dear friends. And really speaking, you and I are but foreigners and aliens. And the actual word, the word actually means you and I are like, are we like squatters on the earth. Yes, uh, uh, we don't really possess anything on the earth. And you know, I'll tell you something this morning. We are not taking it with us. Remember the pharaohs of old. You know, when they were going to die, they'd have these big pyramids. And in the vault, they would, see, when they were going to die, they'd have all their treasure, all their gold and silver buried with them. So thinking that in the afterlife, that they would take all their wealth with them. And some of them, dear friends, would even have their wives buried with them. And they were alive. Thinking they could take them to the afterlife. How foolish and how sad. This is what Job says. Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to that. 
the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, said Job. And you know, friends, the only thing that we leave with when we depart this world, whether through the grave or at the rapture, the only thing we take with us is the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ comes into the in his famous hymn, this missionary. He says, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Mid flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Listen, this spotless robe, the same appears, with ruined nature, saints and years, no age can change his glorious hue. He'll never fade, the colour will never grow, he'll never shade. The robe of Christ is heavenly. That's the only thing we're going to leave this world with, is the righteousness of Christ. And that is if you're born again. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man or woman is born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Do you know the houses we live in, the cars we drive, the very clothes we wear, they are not coming with us, dear friends. And these things, as you all know, the world puts much stock in these, don't they? Remember Jesus he said, don't worry about what you wear, what you drink, what you eat. He says, the Gentiles, the, the, the unbeliever, they chase after these things, but seeking first the kingdom of God. And that's what we should be seeking, the kingdom of God. All these things, they are not coming with us. In fact, you know, people with all their posh homes, their big cars, with their designer suits, their gold watches and fancy chains, they're all going to rust and decay. The hymnist says, did not he? Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay round the all I see. That's what's going to happen to the things of this world. But listen what the scripture says to you and me, to us who follow Christ, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims have seen from fleshy lusts which war against the soul. In other words, what Peter is saying, what Paul is saying, if we are born again, if we are followers of, followers of Christ, then walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Don't go chasing after the things of the world, but the things that are pleasing unto God. And whatever thing we feed the most will characterize our walk, dear friends. So we need to be seeking God. You know, this world, as one man says, is not our destination, but our journey. It's our journey. And there are many things here that can distract you and me, dear friends, uh, from trying to finish our journey. These simple desires, they're actually at war with us, and we are wrestling with them. We don't just wrestle with principalities and powers, we wrestle with this old man. He wants to put a speaker and watch the telly. He wants to do things that are contrary to the word of God. And we've got to crucify him. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. Kill the old man. Put him to death. Walk in the spirit. And then we know the power and the blessing of God. But praise the Lord. Through the Holy Spirit's power, you and I can say no to sin. It's a dirty word today, sin. Isn't it? And we can say no to sin. And we can live with confidence and impact character before this world. A world that is trapped in darkness and so desperately need the light of God. Dear word, dear friends. But what does Paul mean? What is he saying when he writes, our conversation is in heaven? Another translation, you may have it in your Bible, says, our citizenship is in heaven. So both, transla both translations are valid interpretations of the word. But let's look at them one at a time this morning. First he says, or first he is saying, that now we are Christians and are no longer in this world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. Amen? And the Bible says, we're in the world, we're not of it. This is what John says in 1 John 2, 15. He's writing to believers. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man or woman Love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Strong words. Huh? But they're important, dear friends, and we need to take them on board. And because God has saved us out of the world, 
and its evil system. No longer glory, says Paul, in the world. No longer waste your conversation on the things of this life, this world. As Christians, you know, we shouldn't be caught up and engrossed with all the TV soaps. I think sometimes some believers want to rush home from chapel because they want to watch some of the programs of TV soaps. We shouldn't be caught up in all the sport and on our cars and holidays and our homes, but really, as people who are simply passing through, we should be speaking and talking of heavenly things. We should be captivated with the things that God has given us. And, and now I know, uh, you know, we, when we're at home among our families and even at work or down at the shopping centre amongst our neighbours, you know, they don't want to talk to us about spiritual things to them. They're boring. And really, it should be the opposite for you and me. Yeah? The things the world delights in should be boring to us. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. What did Paul say? Old things have passed away. All things become new. Amen? All things, he says, become new. Now, I'm not saying for one moment, don't misunderstand me this morning, that we are to ignore people. No, I'm not saying that. You know, if we do that, we become like hermits. And then we end up, we become like the Roman Catholics, we become a monk or a nun, just as well go to an abbey or a monastery. I'm not saying that this morning. We don't ignore people, dear friends. No, but what I'm saying is, when the children of God, those who profess to be born again, supposed to be new creatures in Christ, our conversation should be on eternal things, on the kingdom of God, and not on these worldly, uh, worldly things. You know, I remember once reading about uh, uh, an article once on the evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. You might have heard of him. He was mightily used of God in the 1950s, 60s. And uh, he was driving a van one day, him and his uh, son-in-law, uh, Jimmy Salter, and there they were moving some furniture, and he was driving down the road, and the widow said, he was chatting away for this and that, and all of a sudden, he shouted, whoa, stop! He said, for the last few minutes, we've been talking about this and about that and everything, and we haven't even mentioned the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and you would think, what's wrong with that? But the conversation went right back to talking about the kingdom of heaven. Talking about things that build us up. Talking about things that edify us, dear friends. Now I know some of you might be thinking in your minds this morning, I can see the cogs going around. Oh, Mr. Preacher is a little bit OTT this morning, the over the top. And I know some of you may be thinking, you know, the old adage, to every minded, no earthly good. Well, personally, dear friends, I disagree with that statement. I believe the more heavenly minded we are, Jesus was always heavenly minded. And we are told to imitate him. I don't believe, uh, and I don't believe any of us can say that in our walk with God that we have accomplished a quarter of spiritual good that Wigglesworth and Salter accomplished uh, in their work for the kingdom of God. And yet, not them, but the grace of God that was with them. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards uh, wrote in the Great Awakening in 1734-45 in Northampton, Massachusetts. He said, to talk about anything besides spiritual and eternal things was soon thrown by the wayside. All the conversation in all companies and upon all occasions was only about religious matters. Unless, of course, it was necessary for people to discuss other matters in carrying on their ordinary secular business. His course on anything besides religion would scarcely be tolerated in the gathering. They were, the, the power of God was present with them, and they didn't want to know about the things of the world. They were caught up with Christ and the kingdom of God. What does that say about our gatherings today, dear friends? You know, how far have we departed from the awareness of the presence of God in the midst? He goes on to say, he continues, the minds of the people were wonderfully removed from the cares of the world. Huh? Again, you may think, yeah, I'll ask you a little bit. OTT. And that is one meaning we believe Paul is teaching about here. Having our conversation in heaven. Talking about spiritual things. And it's only by talking and doing these things do we grow. Paul also is saying, our conversation in heaven it's also speaking of our fellowship with God our Father 
and Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. In other words, he's intimating about talking about he's talking about prayer. You mentioned it this morning. This is what the hymnist says. You know, prayer. Prayer is the Christian's vital right breath. Is uh, is the Christian's need be there? This should come natural to you and me to talk to God, <coughs> to pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be something natural. As a baby, when he cries, dear friends, is what through it at the gates of death? He enters heaven by breath. Do you pray? Do you pray? Every Christian should pray. Another hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. We sang it earlier on. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. You know, to God, all the prayers we pray are the same. To us, they're big prayers, they're little prayers. To God, they're all the same. But he loves to hear the beating of his feet. Amen. You know, God has made it so for us, no matter where we are or what we may be doing, we can pray to God any time of the day, whether in the morning or in the night. We can have fellowship with God. We can, dear friends, converse with our maker. Someone once said, you know, God's life is never engaged. You know that? His life is never engaged. And you know, he'll never put you through to the operator. Why? Because God is the operator. Amen. He always hear our prayers. He is the operator. He's the one who controls the life. And he never gets too busy, the offense, to take our call. Never. Never. You know, in the natural, if the operator wants, they can cut you off. We've all had that for us over the years. But God will never cut you off. Never, dear friends. He will never cut you off. In the natural, people will. And you know, it's not even the party line that someone's going to sit in. I remember when we first got married, when we first moved to our new house, we had a party line. And don't go one day. And there were other people on there. But it's not a party line with God. No, dear friends. No party line. Uh, in praise God, we have a direct line to God and our Father. Amen. So Jesus Christ our Savior, and it's private, it's personal, it's confidential, and whatever you tell God in prayer, He won't tell no one else. Amen? He won't tell no one else. He's a good God. And also, this line we have in prayer to God is free. Amazing! No line like that. No 30, 40, 50 pence a minute charge. Praise the Lord. It's all free, bought with the precious blood of Jesus. That's our inheritance. We can go into his presence at any time. But our conversation, says Paul, is in heaven. The question is, how often do you and I use this communication, this line of communication? Oh, once a day, before I go to work. Oh, when I go to bed in the night. And all that is good. Praise God. But we can talk to God all day. We can talk to him no matter what we are asking. You know, some package line we keep together. I, know, I remember it was uh, evenings and weekends, wasn't it? <laughs> but with God it's all good. Talk to me. And you never talk to no one better, dear friends. David says, this is what the, the, the psalmist says, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Psalm 55. Evening, morning and noon. We can pray to God. Now the words shall hear in the Hebrew have many meanings. But one of them is to give undivided listening attention. In other words, when you talk to God through Jesus Christ our Savior, God will give you his ear. Yeah? The most faithful pleases God, and God will hear our prayers. Yeah? He doesn't just listen to our prayers, thank God, he answers our prayers. You know, I, I was up in London a couple of months ago, it was my worst nightmare. I don't mind driving around the valley, but in my job, I went up to London, the big white van. So I put in a sat there and I was going to Dagna. But instead of taking me around the M25, he took me straight to London. I thought, oh no, this is my worst nightmare. Lord help, isn't it? And I was going through, and I thought, something's wrong here. And I passed this sign, Queen Victoria and Arthur Phoebe. And I went, ah oh, no, I'm in London. Frank the Jack, isn't it? I would never go to London. Eight million population. I said, oh no. I said, Lord, I'm trusting you. I thought, Sam, I'm trusting you. So I ended up, I was down inside Buckingham Palace. The flag was flying, the queen didn't invite me in. And I thought, oh no. I went up to the mall and I didn't go to the centre of London and then the sun had took me down the wrong turn and block. So I took, I thought, what am I going to do? And I shot up this lane and I ended up, I was going to say, there's a double decker bus in, I was in the bicycle lane. I was in the train. And I went, Lord, 
I'm lost. Get me out there. And I tried on God. And all the bicycles would go past and I went, yeah. And there's three lights on the bicycle there. So I said, Lord, I'm just going to trust you for this. And I took the first left and I followed the toad down. And I kept going. And of course, in my head, turned back, go back to the tree. And I thought, Lord, and I could see the sat there just kind of going down. And I thought, I must be getting near to my destination. I know the Lord took me there. Right? He took me straight into the garden of the place I was going to go. Even when the sat there said, God, I'm going to Lord, help! And you my cry. And you heard our cry, friends. Prayer is the key to everything. Pray and keep praying. Now, I know we have other things to do. Let's pray in the morning prayer. Everything. Pray to God. Commit all my ways unto the Lord, says the psalmist. In other words, roll them unto God. All your troubles, all your trials and problems, even your health, roll them unto God and trust Him because He does what is good. But let's move on. Secondly, not only is our conversation in heaven with one another, build each other up on prayer, but our, but our citizenship, says Paul. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, Paul was a very clever man. If you read your Bibles, you know Paul was a, a Hebrew, the Hebrew, tribe of Benjamin, oh, was keeping the law perfect, he says. But he comes to all his done to gain Christ. And Paul was a very clever man. And he knew how to use all these things for his advantage, honestly, masterfully, and lawfully. Yeah? When he was arrested for his faith and testimony in Christ Jesus, the Roman soldiers bound Paul, and they were about to scourge him with a whip and cause. When Paul said to the centurion, Is it lawful? Look how clever he is. Is it lawful to scourge a man that is a Roman? See how he uses his Roman citizenship to escape the lashes of the whip. He does this in Acts 22. He does it again on a number of occasions. Acts 21, 39. In Acts 16, 37, when he's locked up in prison, and they find out the Paul's a Roman citizen, they begin to panic. And the governor says, let him go. Paul says, no, you tell him, don't ask me to go. See how clever the apostle is. He uses his Roman citizenship. And Paul, we all know, had many beatings for the gospel's sake. But if he could get out of unnecessary beatings, he would claim his right as a Roman citizen. Festus, we know, he stood before him and Festus wanted to hand Paul over to the Jews for money and to show him favor. What did Paul do? I appeal to Caesar. Again, using his right as a Roman citizen. And like the Apostle Paul, you and I have British citizenship, dear friends. And, you know, when we go on holidays, we have our passports, uh, the people know who we are and what country we live in, where we come from. But the problem with these passports is that every 10 years you have to renew them. Amen? And they tell a story, don't they? I done it with mine last year. The passports tell a story. You notice that the photo and the new one have changed. You've got a little older. <laughs> and a little fatter. And a little bolder. And a few more wrinkles. Yes, the passport tells the story. We're changing. And not just that, if that's bad enough, you can even lose your passport. What we mean is, your country can rescind your British citizenship and they can take it off you. Yeah? Then we've seen it. So there with that girl who John Dyke says, remember, you've all seen it on the news. She joined ISIS and she lost her British citizenship. And 50 other uh, men went to uh, Iraq and Syria fighting out there with the jihads. Uh, they were all stripped of their British citizenship. And I would say deservedly so for what they were doing. And you know, this may happen to us. Don't be shocked. This may happen to us because of our love for God and Jesus Christ our Savior. Yes. Yeah. We also may lose our right to British citizenship. And I think it's coming that way, dear friends. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says. In John 15, verse 18 and 19, Jesus said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Do you know, I think we just struggle something and try and make the world love us. But really, if we are walking according to the scriptures and in the power of the Holy Ghost, the world would hate us. Why? Because our lives would convict them of the lives that they are living. And not that we hate people who should love our enemies, says the Lord. 
So that if we are living the Christian life, the world will be hating us. Oh, I hate it every time he comes into the room. Oh, he make me feel simple and bad. That's the light we are supposed to have in a dark world. And if you think, are we really walking the walk? Who knows? The laws are changing that quick in our nation, dear friends, that you and I could become enemies of the same. Yeah. Because of our stand for the gospel of our God and Savior, we live in a now multicultural nation, a multi-faced society, and if you and I go around and say John 14, 16, we will be in trouble. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to my Father in heaven but through me, says Jesus. So what you're saying is, in this multicultural nation and society, there's only one way to heaven. And by quoting that scripture, you are saying that every other religion and false cult is wrong. And praise God, there is only one way to heaven. Jesus or Paul says to me, there is no other name given under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And as Christians who are born again, we can say amen to that. You know, we live in, in, in a divisive world, and when we stand up for moral laws that are good, the world will hate us. And when we say homosexuality is wrong, transgender is wrong, these things the world loves, but the church should hate because they go against the word of God. The people need to hear the gospel. Amen. Now the world will say to you and me, conform to our rules. Conform to our ways. But we must never conform. Even if they threaten to take our citizenship away from us. Anyway, we have a citizenship in heaven. Amen. What did Abraham say? For he looked for a city which are foundations whose builder and maker is God. <clears throat> and the passport that we are, dear friends, is written on our hearts. That's what matters. On our hearts. And it will never be rescinded, never be cancelled or taken back. You can't lose this one, dear friends. In fact, the Bible says if you're born again this morning, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In other words, God has put his Holy Spirit in your heart as what? As a guarantee that you make it to heaven. And take that one back with you, dear friends. And what Jesus himself says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them temporary life. I give unto them probational life, if you be a good boy and girl. No, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. When you get to heaven? No, now, on the earth, and they shall never Perish. And none, says Jesus, shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who is greater than all, none shall snatch them out of his hand. We have a double security in Christ Jesus our God. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that at this very moment, every true believer is seated right now in heavenly places. That's where we are, in heavenly places. Every true believer, that's the privilege and position we have in being in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the head, we are the body. And wherever the head is, the body is also. Now I know geographically, we are down here on the earth. But positionally and spiritually, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Do you believe that? You've got to. Because the Bible says it in Ephesians 2 verse 6. If you're born again this morning, you are positionally seated with Christ in heavenly places. Far above all principalities and powers, dear friends. And because of our conversation and our citizenship in heaven, then the one we adore and worship is there also. Where your treasure is, there your heart is, says our Lord. He's going to prepare a place for you and me, a mansion, dear friends. But whence also, says Paul, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what the Bible calls the blessed hope. Jesus is our hope. Yes? Are we looking? Which is a good sign, I believe, that you're born again, if you're looking for Jesus Christ. It's a good sign. A good sign that you are walking in the truth, if you are desiring the return of Jesus Christ. But the opposite can be true. If you're not looking for Jesus, it could be you're content with this life. And many Christians have to say, 
it in tents with life down here. Now, I'm not saying you're not converted. I'm not saying that you could be. You could be coming to church this morning, and you could be singing the hymns, and even singing prayers, and yet never be born again. A lot of people are brought up in religion and Christianity, and they like the lifestyle. Every one of us must experience Christ in our hearts to go to heaven. As I said, oh, it's a definite, it's a sign. If you're not looking for Christ to come, well, I see you're backslidden this morning. You're backslidden. You've gone cold in your walk with Jesus Christ. But if you truly love someone, then you'd want to be with the one you say you love, wouldn't you? And Jesus is in heaven, and he's coming back. Let these words test our hearts this morning. Where are we really happy? Do we really love the Lord? Do we desire this coming? Do we want to be with him? Or have we gone cold? Will it, will, will it disappoint us this morning if we hear Jesus is coming back today? Some are saying, Lord, don't come back just yet. I'm having a good time down here. Don't come back. Can you do it? You know, can you come back when I'm old? Now, the Bible says God has given us all things down here to enjoy and all things in moderation. But if we prefer, prefer the things of this world to the one who loved us and willingly gave himself for us, then I, I would have to say we've got a priority there. For our God is a jealous God. And he will not allow this world to spoil our relationship with himself. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are, we are, or we should be looking for his appearing. For the Lord himself says, Paul shall descend from heaven. Here it is again. Same thing, the rapture, the resurrection of his saints, however you refer to it. He, he shall descend from heaven with a shout. Remember that when the Lord rose Lazarus from the grave, he shouted with a great voice, Lazarus, come forth, and he did. And likewise will be with you and me. There will be a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive, as who are born again, shall be caught up. The word means that Christ is going to snatch us off the earth. Together with them, the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4. 16 and 17. And in that moment, dear friends, when the shout comes and the trumpet sounds, the Bible says we will be changed. Huh? Hallelujah. This is how the hymn is played. Changed in the twinkling of an eye. For the trump shall sound and the dead shall rise, and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Not in a blink of an eye. The Bible doesn't say that, which takes 400 milliseconds to complete. That's fast enough. But a twinkle of an eye, which one man says, a billionth of a second. Now that's really quick, dear friend. It's going to happen that fast. He says in verse 21, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, this body of humiliation, this sinful body, this weak and fallen, and this body of decay is going to be changed. A body that is limited by time and space. A body that is weak and aging. When Christ comes, we've got to be changed. Though in this life, we can be very ungrateful. We just think, well, I wish I was taller. I wish I was thinner. I wish I had blue eyes. Friends, we're going to be perfect on there. Amen. The trumpet's going to sound, and he's going to take us home. And I believe we are living in those days. The signs of the times tell us Jesus is coming soon. When the Jews will be back in the land, it's a sign of the king coming. When the cities and the nations of the world are like Sodom and Gomorrah, it's a sign the king is coming, dear friends. This is what the apostle says. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Victory, victory, blessed, dreadful victory. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Do you know when he came the first time, his people of you missed it. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. In other words, they didn't want him. They were looking for someone else. But when he comes the second time, I believe it will happen that fast that his church will be in his presence before we realize what is taking place. Oh, we may hear the trumpet.
trumpet and even the shout with the voice of the archangel. But by the time the penny drops, uh, before we can fully process what has happened, we'll be looking on in heaven days. Yeah? Another way puts it like this, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day! Hallelujah! What a glorious day that will be. The one that we have loved and served all our lives, the one we've been waiting for, will finally take us home and present us to himself a spotless church without wrinkle or spot. In other words, you and me <laughs> and all those who come, he's going to have a glorious church. Huh? Without blemish. The Greek word means without blame or fault. Amos. No fault. Christ was Amos, says one man, and there was no spot or blemish in him. And he could say to his enemies, which of you convinces me of sin? He said, not even the devil can find anything in me. And when we came home to glory, there would be no sin. Praise God. And because of his blood and his righteousness, we also will stand before God perfect in his sight. Does it thrill your soul? It does mine. Does it excite you? Does it make you want to jump for joy that this world is not your home? You know, you're going to end up in heaven, not in hell. Ah, it, should be, it should be thrilling to us knowing we have a wonderful future. Know that one day soon we're going, we're going to be with the King, the one we should have loved us. But some of me say this morning, ah, they've been saying this for thousands of years. And they are. Praise God. But his church is still saying it today, dear friends. And the message is still being believed. Do you want evidence? Here we are. <laughs> we are the evidence. The message is still being believed. But it's neither now and in the church today. Amen. <laughs> friends, are you ready? Are we ready to meet the King? I pray we are. I pray we will not be ashamed at our Lord's coming, as Peter writes of some believers. But listen, for yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. Are you looking for his coming? <coughs> or have we settled down in this world and become content? You know, I think if we are really looking for the coming of the Lord, it will stir our hearts to live holy lives. Because we know that any moment he can come and take us home. Imagine the trumpet somebody will tell you. Huh? The voice of the archangel. And he will go up here. Imagine the preacher being up here. What a shock that would be. <laughs> Our hope is in Christ. It's a real hope. Amen. It's not a hope as a wish. It's a hope as a certainty that this world is not our home. We are going home. We come round the table of the Lord.